Thank you. So here are my uh, disclosures. And if anyone wants their name up there, just give me money, we'll put your name up. And my, uh, my real disclosure is, is I was a carpenter. Um, I put my 10,000 hours into being a carpenter and literally in the way to the OR for my first few years, I'd stop at Home Depot and get different drill attachments and try to figure out, you know, how are we gonna get power in the OR? So let's imagine an alternative universe where you look into the operating room and you see a neurosurgeon taking a big metal spike to jab it into the skull. That would look crazy. So why do we do that in a spine? You know, how did it end up that that's how we, you know, learned to make a hole in a pedicle? Um, and if you grew up working construction, there was really a culture of protecting your body. And the old guys would say, you know, do everything you can on power because your body will wear out at some point. Now this has become kind of a famous paper. They did a survey of Scoliosis Research Society members. And what they found out here is kind of striking. Spine surgeons have 100 times the rate of cervical radiculopathy than the average person. I've had all these injuries and I've had a posterior foraminotomy for a uh, radiculopathy in my neck. Like we get these operate, we get these problems. And it's in every field in orthopedics, we have an increased risk of hurting ourselves because we are piecemeal laborers. It's kind of important what we do, but we are piecemeal laborers. So these are the tools. Now I think right now, I'm gonna, how many people put screws in under power right now? Okay, that's pretty common. How many people use power to find the pedicle track? So this is, oh, yeah, this is less common. So one of the ways to do this is you take a very thin drill bit and you almost think of it as a ball tip probe. You have lots of feeling and palpation with the ball tip probe and you spin it slow enough that you could see it turn and then the sharp edges, use a sharp drill bit every time, get a new drill bit, goes hard against the cortical bone and soft into the cancellous bone. So this is all about feeling, letting things go where they want to. And then the dull threaded reamer, it's exactly the inner diameter of a 5.5 screw. It has dull threads and a dull end, because I think one time I might have nailed an iliac vein. I just pushed on it and everything stopped. We didn't have to open the kid. Uh, but now you can push this out the front and you can actually feel the front of the anterior vertebral body pretty uh, easily and surprisingly accurately. And then you put in the pedicle screw. And notice there's no tap here. I think that uh, taps are the most dangerous thing in spine surgery, particularly if it's on power. If your drill gets stuck in an on position and it goes into a vena cava or a aorta or something, it could be a bad day. So uh, the flexible drill bit here, you can see it's really flexible. And it will kind of bounce off the hard bone and go into the soft bone. So far, I've never broken a drill bit. And so think of a pedicle as almost being a pipe where the outside is hard, the inside is soft. You see the medial pedicle wall is three times thicker than the lateral, and God made it that way so that you don't poke things into the spinal canal. And here you, could fe you can feel your way feeling hard, 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 soft. It's very kind of a Taoist thing. You go, you let the drill bit go where it wants to go. You know, sometimes it just goes right into the right place, fantastic, but oftentimes you have to feel around a bit. As long as the drill's spinning slowly, you have all kinds of feel. And a few times the uh, reps have timed me putting in screws. It's much less than 60 seconds a screw. This does not slow you up. And what we found out, I should go back to there, what we found out is that when we put the screws in under power, we use less fluoro. I personally don't use an O-arm too much. And I think it's because you could feel better. You have better proprioception with a thin drill bit. And so we looked at six early adopters of this technique. You probably recognize some of the surgeon's names up there. We found out that 99.9% .9 of the pedicle screws placed on power were fine. Uh, there was no permanent neurological injury and the vascular injury I already told you about. So this is pretty safe stuff. And people always ask, what about type D pedicles? Well, that's different. If you have a really thin drill bit, it'll just kind of skive off the side. So just like you have a very stiff, lanky probe there, you know, I tend to use a three millimeter drill bit, which is stiff, and you literally just come up to them and go, drill it right in, no problem. Um, and people say, well, could it get the really tough pedicles? This is a kid who had the original surgery in Florida. They had a robot and intrap CT, and the pedicles were too small, so they didn't put in pedicle screws over many levels, and of course it fell apart. And what I was proud of 
is my fellow, who was with me for about two weeks at that point, she put in all of her pedicle screws in her side. So this technique can get the type D pedicles, it can get the hard pedicles. And so I work with the engineers, they have these cool things, I don't even know what an IMU is, someone in the room might, and it basically knows where you are in space. And it, you put it on the manual screwdriver, you put it on the drill, and what turns out is blue is manual. It's all over the place, it's wiggling, and the power is just kind of like a ray gun, you're not moving as much. And think about it, when you're putting in a screw and you're kind of moving around a bit, you're probably breaking the metal bone interface. And it probably makes that screw a little bit weaker of a screw. And I love when Larry said before how important it is that we get really good screw fixation. And I've seen many times where people kind of make big holes and wiggle around a lot. At that point, it's not a tight screw. You really want to make one thin, perfect channel to put that screw in. And it turns out that in the clinical series, those screws that were put in by hand were four times more likely to fall out than those put under power. And we're going to be doing this in a uh, lab now. Um, so I went one time to uh, Denver, and the engineers were like, yeah, we're going to put EMGs on your neck. I'm like, why would you do that? That's silly. It turns out that everyone's smarter than me, especially those engineers. And they found out that when you used manual technique, the top, the muscles, including the muscles of your neck and trapezius and everything, were over 20% of your maximum voluntary contracture. And that's generally considered dangerous. If any worker is using more than 20% of uh, muscle force in a repeated activity, they're considered at risk for harm, for work-related harm. And I predict that this is one of the things that's going to start to drive hospitals and companies uh, towards power, because otherwise they are knowingly putting surgeon in harm's way. And here it is with the pedicle prep, where you use a little drill bit you know, versus the lanky probe. Look at these neck extensors. The blue, or the manual, is way above that 20% mark, and the red is below it everywhere. So you can see when you use power, you're protecting your body. When you use manual, you're probably going to wear out at some point. Same thing for screw insertion. Now here's another thing that the engineers came up with. They put a force plate underneath the body. And then, you know, we'd put in pedicle screws. And if we did it manually, we were just averaging 25 or 30 pounds downward pressure, up to 70 pounds, and you had this nice big thick thing you could push against. But when you have a little thin drill bit, you're not gonna push too hard, you just know not to, you'd snap it in half. And I'm convinced that the eight to 10 pounds of downward pressure is really just my hand uh, steadying myself there. And uh, this isn't new technology, but I just want to save all the young people here. Um, and uh, you know, Larry teaches this really well. Keep your elbow at your side. You know, brace things against your body. That's how you don't plunge. If you have your elbow above your shoulder, you're going to wear out your shoulder. There's a lot of surgeons whose careers have ended because of rotator cuff disease. So I started power in 2007 to protect me, honestly. I just kept getting all these injuries. But now I use it to protect my patients. It's just intuitive that if we use less force and more precision, it's better for our patients. And when we looked at our series of the early adopters and a series out of Texas Scottish Rite, it turns out that pedicle screws placed just under fluoro or freehand are incredibly safe. And this could call into question, do we really need 3D imaging in all spines, you know, particularly if it's young kids, is it worth the radiation? I don't know the answer to that. We're talking about new technology, so I figure we should bring it up. If you're using fluoro, however, it's vitally important, one, make sure the screw tips don't cross, although sometimes when they're really long, they may cross. And two, make sure you look at different angles with the fluoro to make sure that your tips are not out of the body. You know, I would say at this point, in our technology, a screw being in the canal should be a never event. In addition, we should be stimulating the screws. If you stimulate it and you image it correctly, the screw should not be in the canal anymore. So there's some other cool power things. Who here uses this ultrasonic bone cutting tool? Isn't it great? It's like the greatest thing since sliced bread. So it cuts right through the bone. The bone doesn't bleed, takes very little force. So in the old days, when you took out the inferior facets, you're like, bang, bang, bang. It's like a kill, you know, Attila the Hun. And now you could make these two nice cuts, stops the bleeding behind you, pops the facet out of place, and this is what it should look like in the end. 
And now, I have to admit, I feel a little bit guilty doing posterior osteotomies. It's so easy. You could just take that same instrument, cut through the superior facet, cut through the laminar top and bottom. I even use it now to cut through the ligamentum flavum. You're not really supposed to, but it works. And all of a sudden, nothing's touching between the two bones. You could do that in about 30 seconds. Very, very little bleeding. In my mind, very, very little risk. And there's other kinds of tools. Does anyone in the room use this one, power kerosene? This is awesome. If you haven't tried it, try it. It can have huge amounts of force. And the thing that's kind of good about it is if you have it steadied right in the spine there, you can go click, 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 click really fast with almost no force from your body, just using your pinky. So it allows you to deliver a lot of force right at the jaw, but in a very, very precise manner. So I'd say we should be yet mentoring young surgeons to preserve their bodies, and it's just intuitive that less force improves patient safety. So let's go, uh, I think that Steve was talking about this earlier. You know, I have to admit, I don't use reduction screws. I probably haven't used them in 10 years. Um, you know, reduction screws is one way to do it. Another way is with serial reducers. Almost every good deformity system now has good serial reducers. And the idea, if you want to produce kyphosis, you know, you know do your releases, do your osteotomies, slowly distribute the load over many screws. And in reality, I make myself go sit in the corner for two minutes. <laughs> You know, just allow viscoelasticity to take place, allow the force to decrease. Now, one of the things I find I'm totally inadequate at is teaching derotation in PowerPoint. So I'm going to try it with just two slides. So there's two ways that we could derotate that seem pretty effective. One is bend the convex rod, let's say right thoracic, less the concave rod more. And what's interesting is this rod is going to flatten, this rod is going to bend. So we're going to push down on the right side and up on the left side. And so here's what it looks like beforehand. So this is a thoracic and lumbar double curve. These clusters of four screws each are at the right rib hump. You see it's up there, and the left lumbar hump. So how do we get from here to there? We literally just whoop, rotate the two. So uh, everyone does this different. You know, I have two rods at once because I find bringing the spine to the two rods means that the rods flatten a little bit less. It feels like we are sharing the load over twice as many rods, so the rods are less likely to flatten and bend. And uh, Larry's group has shown that if you put a, uh, like a screwdriver on one screw, that's pretty easy to rip out. But if you put it over four screws and connect them, it's around 13 to 15 times stronger. And if you guys can ever get in a cadaver lab, do this. Put in a screw, put a screwdriver on it, rip it out, it's pretty easy. Put four of them together, you can push really hard, those screws aren't gonna rip out, that's pretty safe. In post-op, we expect the rib hump, I don't like to say that in front of the girls, the rib hump to go away, but more importantly, the hump in the front goes away. So if you think about it, if there's a big hump in the back, of course there's a hump in the front. There's rotation, we never see this, but the kids see it. And only after we really started doing a good job of derotation, I had two girls in the recovery room crying, going, oh my God, you didn't tell me this would get better? I'm like, I didn't know it would get better. I didn't even know it was there. But it turns out that that's what they love the most. Their chest looked better afterwards. And if, here's a totally unscientific. Um, this is almost the opposite of how Larry closes. I've now moved to closing with knotless barbed suture. It's really fast. And what's kind of cool about this is it tightens itself, and if it cuts in one place, you don't lose the whole suture, you just lose that one place, and there's no knots. So this is really sped up closure for me, though there may be some bad things in adults with bad tissue, but with kids, it certainly works wonderfully. And there's a few new different type of plastic adhesive closures that are out there that pull the wound together to help stop it from spreading out and let you see the wound. So we keep these on for about two or three weeks. It's really easy if the parents have questions, they just send us a picture and a text. And uh, tethering, we talked about this a little bit. So both Amr and me are on the Zimmer Biomet design team for a tether. I make royalties off the tether. Um, but the question is, is it really an advance or is it a bandwagon? Is there marketing going on? You know, did this kid, a 39 degree mature person need that surgery? They really like having that left shoulder high. So let's just look at two studies on tethering. This paper won the IMAS Best Paper Award. It was done by the HARM Study Group. And what they found out is in every single category, when they compared a tether 
to a posterior spinal fusion. If there's any difference, the spinal fusion won. The spinal fusion got way better Cobb correction, had way less revisions, and here's what I was surprised at. The tether kids had a worse self-image score post-op. They felt worse about their bodies. So maybe you know, there is a little bit more motion in the thoracic spine, like how much motion is there to begin with, but they were less happy with their body. Now here's one out of the pediatric spine study group, which has apparently the largest spine database in the world right now. Look what happened with the tethers. It went from an average of 50 degrees to 29 degrees, and three years later is 25 degrees. So I think if we're honest with ourselves, this might not be growth modulation. And Amer showed the same thing, and the other study by Horsheimer showed the same thing. So generally, the amount of correction you get on average at the table is the correction. It's generally not getting better over time on average. Now, you always see the ones where it got better. But there's a lot of ones where it gets worse. So on average, this is not growth modulation. And it kind of makes me wonder, is it like this? Does anyone here remember thoracic instrumentation? I remember people at the SRS, like you couldn't walk into the SRS without everyone talking about that. And you had to watch video after video of it. And people would tell me, David, if you're not doing this, no one will ever do your fellowship. And this just disappeared. People don't do this anymore. Who knows, is Tether gonna go that way? Do people not like going in the chest? So talking about new technology, when something new comes out, the results are awesome at first. And that's when people get to speak at Grand Rounds and they make their careers on it and they market and they get patients. And then complications start to occur and the results aren't so good. And this happens over and over and over again. So I would say beware of charismatic thought leaders who are only presenting their good results and not the bad results. Uh, what we really wanna know is the bad results too so that we don't make the same mistakes that other people make and we put our patients first. So EOS machine is a new technology that is awesome. There's up to 98% less radiation. I always say the same kids that won't cross town for the best doctor will cross town for less radiation. So I think EOS is great marketing and great patient care. Uh, magnetic controlled growing rods. You know, growing rods had a complication rate of over 200%. You go on every six to 12 months and you lengthen and lengthen and lengthen surgically. This does it magnetically. It should be absolutely wonderful. And it is, it's the best thing out there, but it has limitations. They don't always lengthen. Uh, 20 to 40% of the time, they don't lengthen the way they're supposed to. But if you keep trying a week later, a week later, almost all the time, you will get it to lengthen. So if, you, if it stops working, don't give up, just keep lengthening it more and more. <coughs> And although this is not new technology, it's the latest thing out there. Everybody wants to talk about Schroth therapy. Now the truth is, it's been around for about 100 years, and in Germany, the local people said, ah, nobody does that, we don't believe in it, kids just get tired of it. But it's big right now in the United States. And you can see, this kid had a miracle. He got better, he got cured of scoliosis in eight weeks, and most of the Schroth papers that are cited are in journals that are like hotel, no tell. You've never heard of them. And the differences in degrees are like somewhere around three, four, five, six degrees. Six is the most I've ever seen. And everyone cites these papers as being science. Um, Cochrane collaboration said there's no evidence to recommend scoliosis specific exercises. Uh, I personally invited Vern and Tony to do this article, and they agree that there's no evidence to support this. And uh, I remember one day, this patient came in and uh, she needed surgery. And uh, she came in, oh actually, this is the same patient the same day, this is my learning curve. She came in like this at first, I'm like, that's remarkable how straight you're standing. She's like, oh, that's how the therapist told me to stand. Well, why don't you stand regular? And it looked like this. So we did a study here. Um, how do you like the first author? That's my smarter kid, my one who's smarter than me. What we found out is when kids stand in a Schroth position, the major Cobb angle is six degrees better on average. That's what all the papers show. So I think what all the papers that show Schroth works is just the kids are standing in a straighter position. And what's funny is there was even a eight millimeter leg length difference. So they're also taught to kind of bend one knee when they stand in a new position. So this may be all that Schroth is. It may be, oh shoot, I'm being recorded. Maybe not, maybe it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. <laughs> Maybe this will win the Nobel Prize for medicine, it's possible. Um, here's the last thing. 
Uh, dynamic bracing. So my disclosure is uh, SIG got me involved in this awesome project. Um, I do have some investment in this. So imagine what we've been doing up till now for bracing is generally these hard plastic braces. And it pushes in one area, and as soon as the spine would move away from it a bit, the force would really decrease, and they're hot, and people don't like bending over in those braces. You can't. So there's something called a dynamic brace. It's won a bunch of awards uh, for innovation. And each one of these things has motion, uh, up and down, rotational, and there's things inside that sense temperature to let us know when you're wearing it, and there will be things that sense pressure. So if we know we want a certain amount of pressure on the ribs, and the kid's getting better over time, we just change this out to put on more pressure. So this is not yet commercially available outside of Senior Sinai right now, uh, but it will be. And we don't know if this works. So far what I've found is it does not correct the scoliosis, the cob angle, as well as a regular brace, but it's so much more comfortable. The girls love it, they wear it more. So we're not sure if that's a good trade-off or not. Maybe someday we'll know. And this is uh, where I work, my new place, Cedar sinai We have this amazing floor of ORs. The Surgeon's Lounge looks over the Hollywood Hills. It's kind of cool. And at any given day, we have about seven spine ORs going at once. And then we let a few neurosurgeons do brain surgery there, too. So all that floor is just neuro. Every scrub tech, every nurse is kind of fun. Any questions, anybody? Thoughts, comments? Sig? <laughs> oh.